This morning's panel will be moderated by Chris Field, the director of the uh, Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment, and the Melvin and Joan Lane Professor for Interdisciplinary Environmental Studies here at Stanford. The plan is for Chris to start with a few questions for the panel, um, and then we'll take some questions from the audience. Again, we're going to use the same format as we did for the presentations. Please submit your questions via the Q&A panel, which is at the bottom of your screen. So I'll now hand it over to Chris. Thank you, Sarah. And let me add my thanks and congratulations to all of the speakers for a really fascinating set of presentations. I know that Steve needs to leave in just a couple of minutes, so I wanted to follow up with with one quick question that I'm curious about the responses for all the panelists on. It concerns the approach to scaling. We've seen lots of evidence of things that are attractive at the plot scale and even at the individual farm scale, but we're talking about moving these things over many orders of magnitude where spatial heterogeneity, uh, farmer acceptance, uh, impacts of environmental extremes, lots of things are going to play a role. And how are we going to learn about the prospect for scaling um, across each of the technologies that you guys are looking at? Steve, do you want to start with thoughts on that? I mean, this is really a difficult thing to do. And it's, you know, when you're running a, when, when you're um, doing a study like the negative emissions technology study, it's the it's the scaling and particular feedbacks involving human behavior that, that leave everyone mystified. You know, you do something, you put a policy in place that you think is going to cause forest landowners to change their management practices because it's an economic win for them. And the uptake rate will be less than 5%. People just don't care, right? They're iconoclastic or something like that. And this is one of the reasons why I decided to put some time into Indigo and help set up the interaction with EDF and that sort of thing, which has been so productive on the methane issue with the big oil and gas companies, because I thought, here's an outfit that has aspirations of going global, right? And aspirate, they, I mean, they have to sell this service to people and they have to demonstrate that it works. Now, it may be that when they muscle up and figure it out, they'll discover their business model doesn't work and they'll quit they'll quit studying it. But if they do figure it out, it's a way to get it done without the public having to pay for it. So, so I think sometimes these corporate partnerships could, well, this, this could be an interesting other way in. Yeah, and, and uh, thanks again, Steve. I really appreciate you joining us and I know what was a really tight schedule today. L let me ask the same question of Zara, who comes at this from more of the private sector perspective than the rest of the, than the, the speakers from this morning. And I wonder if, if there are untapped opportunities for pushing scale or scaling using some of the mechanisms that are more common in the private sector. Yeah, and I think, um, I guess from, from our perspective, we're, we're exploring options right now. So I work in the R&D arm of the corporation. Um, so we're we're focused on what kind of options are there and how can we position ourselves well to utilize those in the future. So we, we do um, have kind of publicly announced um, projects on direct air capture as well as advanced biofuels, both algae and cellulosic biofuels. But I think thinking about negative emission technologies from a, including nature-based solutions is really important. Uh, me personally, I'm a biogeochemical cycle focused person from a microbiology perspective. And I think there's a lot of promise in some of these, um, some of the research that's being done today and a lot of things that we can do today. And so trying to learn all we can and identify research gaps is kind of where we sit right now. But um, we're kind of new to the game a little bit. And Zara, is it your expectation that along the technology lines you think are most attractive, you see the emergence of a, of a few big commercial players, or do you think this is going to be a millions of small producer type of space? Um, I, I think when we, when, when we look at things like this, it's, it would be nice to have one silver bullet, and it's probably going to end up being more of a, a silver buckshot. I don't think one, there's going to be one big solution. I think there are going to be a lot of smaller things. And so trying to figure out where, where we can apply energy and effort on those smaller things to potentially grow them in the future is, is what we're looking to do. 
let me let me just take that that thought and, and transfer it to Anne, who your your comment about the eleven million private forest owners in the U.S. I think highlighted the uh, essence of the human factors in the scaling. And and do you want to talk about sort of how you see uh, more and more of those eleven million being interested in having this be their agenda as opposed to whatever it's been over the last decades? Yeah, I think the way you set up the question, Chris. Um, I have been thinking about it as the other two answers came forward. Um, one is the this whole field of behavioral uh, economics, behavioral insights research. We started doing some of that work at Economic Research Service at USDA and in some cases applied to um, food and nutrition and children and then the other with regard to uptake of conservation practices. And in fact, came up with some really um, enlightening of understanding of what makes and how people make a decision one way or another and especially targeted. So I think this uh, in, in the spirit of where research should be going, uh, I think in really investing more in behavioral economics and behavioral insights research will help us move in that step further. And especially if we are trying to achieve a goal of moving to a, a plant-based from a, a meat-based society and what does that look like? Um, but from a, a policy perspective, uh, you know, there's some real strong, impressive tools within the Farm Bill that really helps drive direction and at a very large scale. I mean, things like crop insurance. Crop insurance touches almost every farmer out there except some of the smaller, what we call specialty crops, but there they have other options. So if, you know, if we could start working within the Farm Bill, bill uh, construct, to think about what is the scale of change you, you want to encourage and what get, what is the, if there's a pull from the producer side and, or for the landowner side that they want the incentives, they see this as an opportunity, then, then you have the best of both. And um, I tend to be a little bit more optimistic too, and maybe I'm in Steve's camp on that. But, um, but I think that is, that is an incredibly powerful tool that we underutilize, I think, for some of the the opportunities to make change um, across the country. And the other reason I mentioned it is because be, there are 16 agencies. There are, if I remember the Farm Bill, there's 156 provisions in the Farm Bill. Almost every part of our life is touched by that, from being growing to consuming. And so if we can hit where the greatest inflection points are to achieve our goals, I think that is, a, again, a very powerful tool to use. David, I, I wonder if you can comment on this, and I, I'm struck that in both the forestry sector and the ag sector, there are millions of producers who are basically interacting with landscapes in order to generate income, and is, the, is it mainly just developing evidence that, that you really can generate income, or are there other factors that... Um, that make the producers in this space tend to be really conservative and, and slow to adopt uh, new approaches to doing business? Well, I, I mean, the US is a special beast. I think every country is gonna have its, its own story. Um, in the US, you know, there's, in particular with the climate issue, there's a lot of sort of, there's a lot of clustering of opinions based on factors that have nothing to do with with evidence or, or with um, this particular issue. But you know, I think the thing that Anne pointed to, which is right, is that incomes, for example, in this country, and I think in the last year or two years, um, the the net income of farmers was 90% from government payments. You know, they are basically scraping by from a from a. Uh, private profit standpoint and they are, whether it's insurance or other types of payments, they've historically been, um, been really incentive, incentivized by, by government action, um, whether it's payments or, or regulation. So if you look back at the ethanol story, I mean, that's, I think, a very good parallel. Like how much, if we look back, how much did that get driven by government policy? How much did it get driven by private opportunity? I mean, it was, it was a combination of both. But, you know, like I was saying before, was that the right use of subsidy from a climate standpoint? You know, I think the question should be not if we're going to subsidize rural landscapes around the world. I think it's clear in this country and in many countries 
that we do. That that's just sort of the the natural evolution of societies that become more urban. Is you're going to effectively be subsidizing these these areas, and you want to make sure that you're smartly using those. Did ethanol was ethanol the right use? You know, for a lot of reasons, you could argue it was. But you know, if you look back 15 years ago or so, was that you know what what is the net climate benefit of having put a lot of um, effort into corn ethanol? Where there were there better uses, and I think that that's sort of my perspective looking forward here is is not if we're going to do it, but let's let's focus on things that we really think uh, have a good chance of working. I, I agree with Steve that like Indigo really bringing a lot of data and experimentation to this is really going to help um, convince the skeptics. I guess I'm just I feel like agriculture there's there's been a lot of experience um, and a lot of I think potential to identify practices that are hugely carbon saving um, and, and that we haven't that the fact that we haven't seen them, I think is that we need to think more, more creatively or more boldly. And maybe that's what they'll do, but I'm just, I think a little skeptical that there's, there's an obvious thing to really incentivize now that that'll work. Yeah. The huge role of subsidies, super, super interesting in this space. Uh, Francesca, let me, let me ask you about how this plays out from the perspective of the individual farmers. And a, a lot of the comments today were focused around the idea that there are win-wins in many of these uh, agricultural interventions, but uh, whether or not people embrace those depends on whether they see them as win-wins. And I wonder if in, in your interactions with the farmer community and in Europe and the US, that there really is an appreciation of the value for their core business of improving soil carbon that sort of parallels their, uh, let's say, increasing awareness of the potential for climate impacts? Yeah, so in, in my experience, in particular in, in this region of the world, but also the way to Kansas and so far, is that as we have said before, the farmer are struggling, the farmer are making their money from failure and, and insurances. Uh, and that's not, you know, yeah, they, they, they are happy to get that money, but that's not their business. And here in Colorado, they don't have more water anymore to do, uh, you know, corn irrigation. They have to convert and, and, and farmers are starting to become pretty, uh, you know, uh, basically what we are seeing is that while we are looking at agriculture to combat climate change, the farmers are combating climate change every day to make their, their, their mid hands. And so uh, they have to come with uh, a different way of doing if they want to have a crop at the end of the year, if they want to have some revenue. We are seeing a lot of return to pasture, a lot of animal integration on, on, on land and, and return to dry land. And so uh, while I, um, so, so in my opinion, it, it's, we all, uh, so, so there are different things. One is that we don't have the one solution because soils are like humans. You know, they respond differently to different treatments. While there are medical doctors understand broadly how to cure something, each of us will respond differently to a different, uh, to a different treatment. And so uh, the same is for the soil. That's why we need to go back to understanding and, and mapping where the soils are, where the potential are, what they can respond. And, 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 and tillage will not work the same everywhere. In northern country, tillage is bad or tillage is bad at depth. In other places, it's great. And it's not just tillage. You have to do it together with cover crops. You need to put the root back in the soils all the way down and all the year, all, all the year round. So it's not one solution, it's integrated and it's integrated at the farm level. The thing is that in the academia, we are still teaching conventional agriculture. And in many uh, soil and crop departments, we, have, we are not giving to the, the new farmers the right information on how they need to treat their soils and how they have to make profit in the face of climate change. The most important thing to farmer is to have a resilient uh, system. Maybe never have peak production, but have production year after year. And so I think that we need to work on the farm bill. 
and and the uh, the way the reason why farmers are not changing and i was with a lot of them in kansas last week and the first reason they say we are not changing is because if we change we don't get the insurance at the end of the year and so they prefer to fail their crop and get insurance um, and and that's why we need to work together with the science with the academic the way in which we teach the new farmer the ag consultant be there in the field the solutions are there are more integrated, are more farm specific. And the nice thing is that I'm working with Nutrien, I'm working with McDonald's, I'm working with the General Mills, I'm working with Indigo. The industry is wanting to do that. And once the industry wants to do that, we can actually go up to scale. Yeah, it's super interesting to think that the fact that agriculture is so subsidy dependent or so insurance dependent really does mean that there's some potentially additional leverage from public policy. You have to have the right public policy, but the, but the leverage is there. I, I wanna ask about a, a theme that came up in, in David's talk about that maybe the best way to think about agriculture is to make agriculture so productive that we need less land, either by increasing yields or by uh, shifting away from meat-based diets. I'll, I'll start with Zari, you, you know, uh, um, a lot of the emphasis that you bring on um, on algae production and intensive bioenergy production would have implications for how much land is needed for energy crops, especially. And, and, and how much do you think about land sparing as a, as a part of the agenda that, that you're trying to develop at ExxonMobil? I think land is always, is, is always a part of the conversation when we think about um, I mean, even, even thinking about algae ponds and some of the work they're doing there, how do you, I, I mean, I don't know how many folks know what we actually are doing with algae biofuels, but it's actually to increase the photosynthetic efficiency of an individual cell. So you grow, grow more algae at depth, right? Because the sun hits and then all the algae have to spread out. And so you need large, large ponds. And if you can increase the photosynthetic efficiency of a single algae cell, let more photons pass to one beneath that you can actually decrease the, the overall footprint is, is the, the hope. Um, and so I, I think land is very imp important when we think about algae, when we think about um, even cellulosic biofuels and we think about, about anything where we, we do have a footprint. Um, the idea would be, um, I mean, I don't know if you were asking specifically about algae biofuel, but the idea is looking for areas that have high, high sunlight that maybe aren't used for other things like so deserts close to coasts, you know, things like that to try and not compete for food. Algae is in it um, intensively pr productive. And so compared to corn ethanol, it's a lot less uh, land needed per gallon of fuel produced at the end. Uh, and so those are, I, I guess, to long answer to a short answer, it's land is very important and we'd like to decrease our land usage when we're thinking about things like biofuels. Great, thank you. Let, let me um, ask one more uh, aspect of this land sharing. I'm gonna pose this question to David who uh, emphasized the importance of manure in uh, natural climate solutions. But then Steve highlighted how exploding demand for meat alternatives is, uh, is reshaping the demand for grazing land but it's also going to be impacting the availability of manure. I, I wonder if you've done any quick calculations as the conversation's gone on about the implications for natural science, natural climate solutions that are manure based. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, a lot of the, the available manure is, is from dairy cattle. I would say that a lot of the beef cattle, like they're mostly spending their time on, on grasslands where the manure is not, not recovered. So, and, and, and these substitutes are not just meat substitutes, obviously they're the, the takeoff of dairy substitutes is, is very large. So it would certainly, you know, it, it would reinforce this question around scale um, associated with relying on, on livestock uh, integration or livestock manure for increasing, uh, increasing soil carbon. And on the more general question of meat and dairy substitutes, um, you know, I think Steve is, I agree with him that there's, the scaling there is, is potentially fast and the implications for uh, carbon balance in, in, in agriculture is, you know, the implication could be big. Um, 
and that I think just relates to, or maybe ties very closely to this question of how are you going to support rural communities? Because, because I think the, in agriculture, there's always this risk that prices are going to jump up and land's going to be clear, but there's also always this risk that somehow prices are going to fall through the floor and, and rural communities are going to be devastated. Um, so along with the carbon opportunities provided in terms of land sparing, there's probably some either risk or you could look at it as carbon opportunities provided by then it's just going to ramp up the rural demand for, for some sort of uh, support payments of some sort. And maybe those could be um, kind of a win-win in a sense of, of essentially paying people to, to farm carbon as much relative to, um, to, to food or much more than we do now. Yeah. And if we do make progress with uh, sparing land from agriculture or grazing, and if you as a forest planner had the potential to think about increasing the forest estate globally by, you know, hundreds of millions of hectares, what kind of opportunity, what would that present if you were thinking about uh, not, not doing a better job managing the forest we got, but increasing the amount of forest? Would, how would that change the, the agenda you bring and, and how do you think about the issue of natural climate solutions under that circumstance? Hmm. Great, great question. Yeah, there's um, a lot of a lot of involved in that one. Um, I think one one topic that we haven't really brought up very much is is the notion of agroforestry, and the opportunities to really better integrate um, agricultural production of certain crops with the forest side and the incentives associated with that. And we've seen the growth of that approach, but it's um, it's not nearly it's not been nearly as aggressive as I think it could be within this context. And so part of what I've been thinking about is how can we expand the use of, of an agroforestry component um, that would also hit some of those 11 million non-industrial private landowners I mentioned who are thinking about not necessarily an economic return, but probably wouldn't mind having an economic return if they could get the other ecosystem services for the reason they have that land. Um, I think the other, other aspect is the, um, the whole opportunity to grow our urban forest. We think about street trees, but there are some real opportunities within almost all of the, especially the Rust Belt cities, where you um, have certain neighborhoods that have been declining, a lot of outward movement, um, opportunities to reframe those as pocket parks, like we've done in Baltimore, or larger kinds of um, of um, chunks of, of trees and urban canopy, because we do know that there is a positive quality of life that goes along with that, energy reduction, a, a climate response, a pollution response. And so to be able to grow that, and, and many cities are really excited about doing that, um, it's, it takes maintenance, but I think the, the opportunity is out there. And if we can continue to provide the tools and the information, I think that is uh, one aspect but the other notion, and this is not specifically on forest, but I do want to just bring it up. You know, we have just been going through and are continuing in a really grand experiment of overturning the food system um, through the through COVID, and the fact that we went from one third to one half of our meals away from home to zero meals away from home. Um, that's changed the access to food, the packaging of food. I mean, it's really become very complex, which has a direct result on land use and the distribution, as well as how we are, um, farmers themselves are responding to that through a direct-to-consumer approach. We don't know what all of that, does that continue in the future? Do people really like it that way? What happens to those who can't afford the higher prices, but we have gone through higher prices? So I think of this in this larger spirit of thinking about um, land use change and people's behavior using data from the last, I'm not even sure how many months has been now, <laughs> have been going through a really radical societal change and, and thinking about that. Um, and then I'm gonna take my moment for one more thing because we, we haven't really talked as much about public lands as I think I should have and we could. Um, Steve mentioned that we really can't do much more reforestation. I disagree. We have nearly 85 million acres of understocked 
poorly stocked forest right now that are federal lands that are just waiting for reforestation that is well designed and that is adequately funded and to turn it into healthy growing forests rather than what we have right now. So I think we, we really do have an opportunity in that space to, um, to change how our forest policies are, are being implemented. A lot of it is funding. We know how to do some of this, but it also have making sure we have the right materials. I think somebody said this, the right materials in the right place uh, to be able to be sustained over the, the climatic conditions we have. And is that, is that opportunity primarily a consequence of, of um, de degrading the characteristics of these forests through historical harvesting and other kinds of utilization? Or? I, I, I think it's a combination of several of those factors. Um, certainly, I was thinking about an Arkansas forest I visited that is, um, has trees on it, but they're all scraggly. And because they were high graded in the past and you have poor genetic stock and you could really improve through silviculture at that forest. So that's a past, but then there's the, the whole wildfire situation and the fact that we have overstocked poor, too dense forests so that the trees that are growing are not healthy and are being affected by um, insects and diseases. So to be able to restore them to a healthy, um, healthy state, there was a, I just, in fact, for preparation for this, I read a paper by Malcolm North who actually has Think of, the, think of the interior west as a great big yard and how you might landscape that yard to get a really robust future forest. It was fascinating, but it, it is about intermixing and really having more, um, more deliberate design on the reforestation that takes place. But that's active reforestation. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. you have to go out and do something as opposed to natural regeneration. That's great. Um, I, I want to make sure there's time for questions from the audience, but I uh, I do want to ask one final question to Francesca, who's uh, spoken really compellingly about what we can do in the ag soil space. And quite a lot of the conversation has been now about, well, what do you get if you switch from ag lands to forestry? And, and I, I wonder if there are parallel opportunities for improving the carbon stocks of, of forest lands or whether the forest game really is a tree trunks game. No, I think the, actually, you know, from our uh, analysis in Europe, forests have the highest carbon stocks in Europe, um, with ag coming second just because the ag is in, in higher uh, amount. So uh, forest soils do hold a significant amount of carbon. I think uh, the issue there is more on the avoided emissions because a lot of the carbon in forest is in unprotected form. And so a lot of the northern forest, if they go into a warming environment or, or fire, even can burn or even that um, the, the soil carbon. So um, on one hand, we need to make sure that we manage forests with an eye on protecting the existing storage. Uh, but also, as I was saying, uh, with regards to um, uh, to to um, uh, to forest management, it's important to think about the combination of species, the association with mycorrhizal, because that drives a lot of the carbon sequestration in those forests. Um, and um, and so, for sure, th there is a a, a a lot of of, of carbon. Uh, I'm not. To be honest, I don't know how much more, you know, we consider them more or less at equilibrium. So it's, it's, it's hard to imagine that you can uh, accrue the forest eye on an accrual carbon stage, but um, they, they could be since they are on um, many forests in an accrual uh, uptake. Um, one thing to, to consider is, you know, all the work we did in elevated CO2 and so the, 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 the forest I uptake in more, but I also cycling that carbon faster and not really storing that much more um, into, the, um, into the soil. We also worked on biochar in forests and so there have been in particular here in the Rockies with a lot of the uh, dieback because of the pine beetle. Um, we studied whether we could use the dead trees in order to produce on-site biochar and add it to the forest soils. And, and, and that is a possibility. You can surely increase carbon that way, how easy it is. And, you know, there is all the 
the operations in forests are never as um, as easy as as they are in, in ag. But um, I I think uh, small scale biochar unit in forests that use the residual wood and and produce char that is added straight into the forest could be a way to further increase carbon in, in forest soils and and then they need to be protected what is there. Okay, well, thank you very much. And, and thanks again to all of this morning's presenters for a really uh, fascinating and, and in many ways challenging set of presentations. I want to make sure we take some time for the, the best part, the questions for the audience. And then if I understand the agenda for today, I'll come back at the very end with a, a couple of, of summary slides. So let me pass it to Jenny for questions from the audience. Thank you, Chris. Awesome, awesome panel discussion there. Um, so we have a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, we'll start with Mary Kate Lulin, who has a few points to raise and questions. Mary Kate, um, apologies for mispronouncing your name. Please unmute yourself when you're ready and uh, ask your questions. Hi, you got the name right. Thanks so much. So Mary Kate Bullen with New Forest. We're a sustainable forestry investment manager and pretty active in natural climate solutions. I wanted to just raise one thing that I think is a really important piece of the picture that ties together a lot of the threads the panelists have brought together this morning around the way that entities and corporations in particular are reporting on their climate impacts. So we're involved right now with the greenhouse gas protocol revision process, which is looking to include carbon removals and land use related emissions consistently in greenhouse gas protocol reporting. And it's grappling with topics that I heard the speakers address this morning, ranging from stand level to landscape level issues. So how would we actually understand the impact of substitution benefits? How do we deal with non-permanent carbon removals? I'm just wondering from all of the good thoughts this morning, what do you think we can do to really bring the benefit of the research and academic world to better inform this effort, which is really kind of grappling right now with how do we bring NCS and the actual existing impacts of business as usual into corporate reporting and support the uptake of more comprehensive land use reporting at the entity and organizational level from companies. I wasn't sure if that was familiar for an open, open um, question. I guess that's where I want to go back to my comment about FAR certification as a, a system to be used. Uh, I, I, I have seen a lot of um, companies in order to meet their ESG goals being very proactive in the climate space. And I think I would love to get credit for that and in a way that is um, comparable and measurable. And, and that's you know, part of the reason why having some kind of um, system-wide approach, I think becomes really important. Everybody knows that everybody's reporting the same way in a way that is comparable. But um, the reason I like forest certification as a concept is because, well, for one thing, we've bought into it now for, what, 20 years. And many, of, if not most, of the companies are um, in using one system or another, whether it be SFI, FSC, or however, tree farm system, et cetera. So they're, it, we're used to reporting. There's a mechanisms to do that. There's a system for third-party verification. It's systematized. And I think until, and there is a market share associated with it. So until we can do something like that, um, that to me, that's the, if you will, the low-hanging fruit. We have a system. It lends itself to that kind of, of regular, regularization and system-wide approach. And so how do we build now um, carbon and climate into that system? Um, I actually feel very hopeful about it. I've, I've been watching from the sidelines SFI's conservation approaches and some of the discussions they're having are, in fact, moving in this direction. And then I'll say the other part to this is, at least in the US, we have an, a comparable system exists in Canada and I think in Mexico now. The forest inventory program gives us, again, a forest-wide, whether it be public or private, system for measuring. If we can do it at the scale that's needed and we build that into the certification scheme some way, then you have, again, a, a comparable system for everybody um, rather than many different ones to be sorting through. So I, I don't know if that gets to your point, but that, that, that just strikes me that that is the uh, using what we have in a way that is much more um, explicitly dealing with carbon, I think, would, would make a whole lot of sense. Thanks, Anne. That's a, a great thought and reply. I think what's been good in this process is to see that those tools are being used and referenced for the U.S. context, and then 
one of the things I try and bring to our working group is saying, how can we do that outside the US? Because unfortunately, the rest of the world doesn't have the benefit of as comprehensive data as we have in like the FIA system. So it'd be great to see the, the US lead on that and provide a system that could be scaled. Thanks, Mary Kate. Thank you, great question. Um, so we'd like to go to Shafiq Jaffer now. Shafiq, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your questions? Yeah, I think this uh, question is perhaps a little bit more directed at Francesca and Anne a little bit. I think this um, point of ancillary benefits in some of the approaches either in soil or forestry is quite important, especially in the developing economies where you know carbon credits or carbon mitigation isn't the, the focus of policymakers and lawmakers. How do we kind of bring this kind of more to the forefront rather than talking about this through NCS? How do we perhaps bring that more to the forefront of the other values that it can generate for their economies and for their uh, people? Yeah, the, to me, that goes back to the idea that, um, you know, we need those, those systems to stay productive. We need food from them. And besides carbon sequestration, the, a lot of the problem uh, currently is the high um, variability in uh, production um, from here to here. And to me, the, 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 the real message is to build the resilience in agricultural system. Uh, sometimes, you know, being a scientist and being an ecologist, um, I, I, I come with that um, mindset to act. Um, and, uh, and, and so, um, uh, but, but that to me is the, the, the winning uh, message for the uh, farmer, but also for the, for the public, is that uh, we, the, the goal is not maximum productivity one exceptional year, by putting a lot of fertilizer and irrigation and pesticides that year after year have started working off, as, as uh, David was saying, that now no-till is an issue because the, the um, uh, you know, with control, uh, the, the chemicals don't work anymore. And, and so the, uh, the, the, the message is that we need to go back to a more holistic view of agriculture for, um, or making it a more resilient system that can ensure the productivity we need to feed the, 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 the growing population on earth. And by doing that, you have everything else as a co-benefit. Actually, carbon can be a co-benefit of that with the first, with the first message being you'll be more productive as a, as a in, in, as a business, as a farmer, if you strive for resilience and not for maximum productivity. So I, I saw um, another another part of your question, which I don't know if this gets to it, but it, it struck me as you were talking about payments for ecosystem services as part of that the um, way forward. And I in particular feel like water is, and it's undervalued in terms of its role related to forests and agriculture. I remember the 2010 RPA assessment identified 83% of surface derived drinking water for the United States comes off farms and forests. And if I remember it correctly, 58% of that is forest. So if you have a fully functioning healthy forest, downstream water quality is going to be improved. But coupling that action of management with the downstream valuation by the utilities so that there's a willingness to pay is one of our challenges. And um, we have done some work at RFF on source watershed management and the willingness to pay question. You see it clearly in places like Mount Hood connected with Portland, Quabbin Reservoir in Boston, Catskills in New York. How do we then promote that kind of um, linkage in other municipalities and be able to get that, that benefit? So if you have a healthy watershed, you have a healthy forest, then, then you actually are promoting some of the things we're talking about with regard to carbon, but you're coming in through the water quality lens, which I think has, a, has greater play. And I think Shafiq, maybe I was a little bit of what you were getting at, and, and I'd love to see that really promoted more. Yeah, you're, you're exactly on point there. Um, and I think this question of how do you bring this valuation such that uh, the people that are going to have to pay for this at the end of the day for the benefits understand that, right? 
uh, so uh, thanks for that. And yeah, then, and I like to add that actually the water uh, apply very well also to uh, the agriculture. And the other incentive is that they can reduce the the input rate. If if you start managing, for example, the 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 nitrogen and and the natural um, um, uh, uh, input of of nitrogen from from uh, nitrogen fixation or from integrating the animals. Um, then, then you 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 know they can save on on input cost. Yeah, exactly. And, and the the other question I had was maybe a little bit more directed, I guess now, David. But and since Steve is not there, and perhaps uh, Francesca, you know this. But in terms of how far crops are today from their maximum yield, you know, when we look globally and say, okay, if you could really maximize yield in the existing agriculture, what amount of land can you really avoid from potential land reuse changes and things like that. Do we have kind of a global estimate today on that? Yeah, there are definitely estimates out there uh, in terms of total potential uh, gains. And uh, I think that you, if you think about uh, sort of economically optimal, so, so we're never gonna purely be maximizing yields, that would be too costly. Um, but like in the US, for example, we routinely see yields that are 80% of, of what is possible. Um, and if you look throughout the systems of the world and you figure out what the gains would be by getting up to that level, it, it's significant. It's something like, I don't know exact number, but it's something like 30% um, increased production if you, if you did that, which is a lot, you know, a big chunk, not the entire chunk, but a big chunk of what we would need on current trajectories to meet demand growth. So, um, you know, I think that there is a lot of synergies between the types of things you want to do to increase overall food security um, and the types of things that Francesca was talking about, which would increase potential soil carbon in, in the systems. And I think a lot of people have therefore, you know, in, in some ways felt the ends justify the means. If, if, if selling the carbon benefits is going to be what, what gets people to say improve their soils, which people think will be the right avenue, um, people have been comfortable doing that. I personally think that it's important to make sure um, that we don't uh, oversell those benefits, but there certainly are real. I think it's also important, this is one maybe in, in the spirit of being a good panelist and, and trying to disagree as often as possible with other panelists. I mean, I think I also came at this as an ecologist, trained as an ecologist, but I think it's important to think of the, the food system overall um, as resilient it has many different modes of resilience and, and sort of the on-farm resilience is only one of them. In the U.S., you know, if you ask yourself, would you rather be in the position of the U.S., which has large year-to-year -year swings, but very high productivity, or like an alternative world or another country where you have much lower inputs, much less year-to-year -year, um, variability, we get resilience from sort of the, the risk management practices that we practice, not the on-farm resilience. Now, that doesn't mean we don't want to improve the on-farm resilience, but it's just we don't want to overemphasize that one sort of tool that we have. So there are synergies, but I don't think we, we want to kind of oversell the synergies um, in the name of, uh, or, or because it risks, I think, reducing overall progress towards food security and, and food supply goals. Yeah, 